fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Good on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is back on the chair. I'm back here. Yes. Yeah. Chain to the chair. Chain to the chair. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy dog. Anyway, so now it's a, it's another all important show. It's a great show, actually. We've got another mm. returning guest, and it's true crime or kind of mafiosa. There's it's just everything biography. Um, so let's bring in Matt Birkbeck. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So now your book, Life: The Life We Choose. How did you get connected with them? I got a, an email out of the blue in August of 2020 asking if I was interested in speaking to Billy. I had, when I was a newspaper reporter, I had covered Billy in the early 2000s when he had gotten arrested. Billy had been the head of the Buffalino crime family that was based in northeastern Pennsylvania, but it was ten tentacles that stretched throughout the country. And he had been the head of the family since 94. But what's really unique and interesting about Billy is that he was the protege and so-called son of Russell Buffalino, who was arguably the most important and influential organized crime figure in the 20th century. So when Billy got arrested in 2006 um, in, uh, on a money laundering charge, every law enforcement agency had wanted to talk to him, uh, Homeland Security, uh, Secret Service, New York City Terrorism Task Force, and the FBI. The FBI especially wanted to talk to him about Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa, the disappearance of Hoffa, because uh, Russell Buffalino had been one of the lead suspects. And Billy didn't speak to anyone. He refused to. So when I get this email, it's one of those moments where you're looking at it, and you're not really sure it's true, but could, you, right. your jaw drops because you know how important he is. And I answered the email, and then Billy and I are meeting two weeks later, and before you know it, we're working on a book together. That's crazy, because because again, yeah, it's it's weird when you get an email from someone or someplace all of a sudden out of the blue, and you're like, what? Is this real? And it turns out to be real. It's almost. Do you ever wonder why why did he pick you? Um, he, I guess I I wrote a book in 2013 on Buffalino called The Quiet Don, and it was about the Buffalinos. Only it was based mostly on documentation, FBI reports, old news clips, and interviews with some like second and third hand people. And the book did very well, but um, Billy wanted to set the record straight on a couple of things, um, particularly the 2019 movie The Irishman oh, yeah. and Frank Sheeran. He knew Frank Sheeran really well. And according to Billy, the movie was fiction. So I, you know, Billy knew me from when I reported on him years ago. Uh, he knew my reputation and my history as an author and as a writer. And, you know, I, I got the lucky call. And uh, it turned out to be, I mean, it took a few months to get him going. But once he did, it just, we spoke for well over a year, year and a half, two years. And it was just incredible. Yeah. Because you have to get over the, the idea um, in a sense of when, when he's contacting you and he wants to get the record straight in his mind or what he, his point is, but you also as a writer want to make sure it's, it's the truth or accurate, you know, but you don't want to offend him. You want to make sure the overall book comes out realistic. So how do you draw that line or how do you decide what of what, of what he says or what information he gives you, you're going to actually use? Luckily for me, we spoke, we did dozens of interviews and he and everything, we checked out what we could, you know. Um, I had a research assistant work with me on this one. And, you know, historical um, subjects, you know, for instance, let's say Jimmy Hoffa. You know, Billy would 
talked to us about when he met the, when he met Hoffa, where he met Hoffa, his relationship with Russell. He also told, you know, he would give us some events that occurred. And we go back and we check it out, and it was true. Um, that's a really good question because had I only interviewed him for a week or two, then I'd probably, you know, be a little bit leery about everything he's telling me. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've known the man for almost three years now, and I'm going to tell you, I didn't find one instance where he lied to me or tried to, you know, kind of get me to go off what he was telling me or told me a version of things that wasn't correct. Um, you know, he was, he's, he was the one thing about Bill, he was, he was open and he was honest. Um, I mean, some stuff even pained him to admit to when, particularly when it came to Russell Buffalino because he loved Russell, but I was really comfortable with, um, I mean, we even spoke to, you know, plus Billy had documents, you know, he had documents that Frank Sharon had given to him, um, who had claimed to kill Hoffa. And, you know, one of those documents included a letter he wrote to Hoffa's daughter, Barbara Cranser. And we called Barbara and we spoke to her about the letter and she verified everything. So, um, I was very, very comfortable with what Billy told me. Um, it is his story. You know, my job was to basically interview the guy as much as I could and get as much as I can. And it's, you know, it's pretty wild. Um, but then what I really had to do, which is really what I got to do when I write these books is come up with a really interesting and complex story, you know, uh, a really good way to tell it. And I, yeah. and I think I did that with the reaction so far over the, for, over the first two days, I think I did that. Of course you did. I mean, <laughs> it really, it's really complex and really interesting because he's so involved in, the community and so many different aspects, like you were mentioning, you know, from celebrities like Michael Jackson and Shook Knight to Marlon Brando and stuff too. So, um, you, so it really kind of involves a lot of people in popular, I don't know, popular media as well. So do, do you find that you have to kind of be careful how it's, how they're connected with them and, and how you write them? Not necessarily be careful, just show the proper respect. It's like, you know, I'm telling a story and, you know, this is real life and there's no need for me to embellish any of it or to take one little kernel of something and make it much, much bigger than it was, you know. I mean, this turned out to be a historical document. Uh, the Buffalino family was one of the most powerful families in the country, and that was due chiefly to Russell Buffalino, who – you know, had casinos in Cuba. He knew the dictator there, Fulgencia Batista. He used to put Batista's kids up uh, in the summertime in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> he had gone toe-to-toe with Bobby Kennedy during the rackets hearings in the late 1950s. He had set up the Appalachian meeting in 1957, the famous meeting where the mob guys got arrested in upstate New York. Uh, you know, he later had a huge hand in the Godfather movie, in terms of the Godfather actually being made and not just being made, but uh, right. including members of, you know, the Buffalino and Colombo family in the movie. Um, and then, of course, there's politics, there's entertainment, and then there's Jimmy Hoffa. And, you know, Buffalino's, Buffalino's power and strength and influence came from his association with the Teamsters Union. And, you know, in the 1940s, he had placed his cousin William there, with, uh, who was an attorney, with Jimmy Hoffa, who had a local there in, in Detroit. And it was a masterstroke because William Buffalino became their general counsel uh, when the Teamsters became a powerhouse in the 50s. And Russell had huge influence in Teamsters matters and also had control over the central state's pensions, pension funds. So he's getting loans out for casinos, hotels, all kinds of construction projects. So he was an immensely, immensely powerful individual and Billy's by his side for 28 years, you know, as his, you know, Russell and his wife didn't have any children. So they sort of adopted Billy, you know, Russell loved Billy and Billy loved Russell and they were together at the hip. Even when Russell was in prison, uh, it was Billy who was running the family. And, you know, his introduction to Russell Buffalino opened this incredible world to him and uh, which is reflected in the book. So, so now he didn't like the Irishman. He didn't like that. Uh, portrayal. He thought it was, you know, false and all that stuff. So, um, what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? Is he coming back with JFK Jr. or something? Are we going to see him? I mean, normally I would say read the book, but I know <laughs> this is too big to let go. 
um, without some kind of a comment. So, you know, as Billy said, you know, we did do some interviews, some national interviews over the weekend. And Billy, I think Billy's words were he was cooked, meaning he had been killed and then um, incinerated almost immediately. And, you know, Billy discloses a meeting, a very important meeting that takes place a couple of days after Hoffa disappears or maybe a week or so. Um, and it's a meeting in New York between that Buffalino tells Billy, come on, we're going to New York. Russell spent half his time in New York and they went to go meet with, uh, two major crime figures there, Tony Provenzano and Anthony Salerno, both members of the Genovese family and Frank Sharon. And so, you know, according to the Irishman in a book that Frank had written, you know, that, that meeting was held for Frank to report back on him killing Hoffa. And according to Billy, that just never happened. What the meeting was about was that Frank Sheeran wanted to kill the people that ordered the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, which was Provenzano and Salerno. And so Russell put them together to basically, to get Billy, to get Frank Sheeran to, um, assure them that he would not harm them. But what Frank Sheeran didn't realize at the time, and it took Billy, it was, it was great pains for Billy to admit this. But Provenzano and Salerno would not have given the order without the approval of Russell Buffalino. You know, Russell had been under a lot of pressure because of uh, the so-called CIA mafia plots that were being investigated in Washington at the time by this church committee. It was a famous committee. And Russell had been outed by Time magazine in June of 1975 as being uh, one of the CIA recruits to help kill Fidel Castro and help provide surveillance for the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion. And so Russell, up until that time, Hoffa wanted his union back after getting out of prison, and Buffalino had protected him. But once his Russell's name was out there, had been leaked, um, he couldn't protect Hoffa anymore. It was actually Hoffa who the CIA had reached out to to uh, connect with Buffalino, and Buffalino feared that he was going to be subpoenaed along with Hoffa and several other members of organized crime. Such a different world back then, wasn't it? It's, it's changed so much. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, how, how is he with, with, with life and what has happened and what he was a part of? Does he feel, did, did he portray any sort of feelings one way or the other, like happy, sad, unapologetic? You know, where was he? He misses it. Uh, you know, I asked him, you know, obviously the book is called The Life We Chose. And this was the life. No, Billy wasn't. This was this was the life he chose. Billy wasn't born into the mob like many other people are uh, or were. Billy was a student. He was a business student in Pittston, Pennsylvania, and he was in the Army Reserves. And it was just a chance meeting with Russell Buffalino. You know, he had met him once before, just a handshake um, at his sister's wedding. Um, and Buffalino was there with the former Yankees great Joe Pepitone. And, but later he had been called to install an eight track stereo into Buffalino's car. Uh, <laughs> and then he drives the car back to a luncheonette in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to meet with Buffalino and he can give him the keys to the car and they hit it off. And the next thing you know, uh, they're together side by side. Billy had a very difficult relationship with his own father, as when you read the book and one of the opening chapters, you'll see why. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a pretty devastating scene. And so he warms up to Russell. Russell warm, warms up to him. And so the book is really, I mean, despite everything that's going on and all the people that you meet, uh, it's really at its core a father and son story, you know, uh, with an organized crime background. But, you know, it's very intimate in terms of their relationship and how much they really cared for each other. It's also really interesting how Russell had tested him over the first few years just to see how loyal he would be. And Billy passed the test with flying colors. Was there something that uh, he told you that you weren't expecting? Was there any sort of surprise in your interviewing with him? Yeah, Donald Trump, for one. He crossed crossed paths with Trump on a number of occasions. Um, Michael Jackson, which was included in one of the Trump stories. I can actually share this one. Um, mm. You know, Billy managed Michael Jackson. And so at least he mentioned that to me, and I didn't believe it at first. And I said, well, how did that come about? 
And so yeah. he said, so this is the late 1980s. Russell, Russell Buffalino is in prison now, and Billy is now the de facto head of the Buffalino family. And keep in mind, even though they're based in Pennsylvania, they're incredibly powerful. And they spent a lot of time in New York, in Philadelphia, in Los Angeles, in Kansas City. And so there, Donald Trump had wanted Michael Jackson to perform at one of his casinos in Atlantic City. And Jackson's manager, whose name was Frank DeLeo, and for anyone who's seen Goodfellas, they'll know him uh, as having played the cab stand owner, Tootie, Tootie Cicero. And so he was he was Jackson's manager, and he said Jackson doesn't play casinos. So Trump, not wanting to take no, he goes and employs two heavyweight gangsters from the West Coast, from L.A., and offers them a million dollars if they can convince Jackson's manager to let him perform. Well, their convincing is basically threatening him and saying, you're now <laughs> going to take over Jackson's contract. And so DeLeo uh, reaches out to friends in Pittsburgh, and those Pittsburgh friends can't deal with this because these guys in the West Coast are too big, but they reach out to Billy, who's at this point now the mob's negotiator. And there's this big meeting in Manhattan, in New York in 1988 during the Grammys, and these two guys, and he's got two guys show up and they see Billy there and they realize that's it. The gig is up and they beg Billy to let it happen. They offer him half of the Trump million dollars. Billy says no. He kicks them out. Frank DeLeo, the manager is ecstatic and Billy goes, nope, this isn't over yet. I'm now your partner. And Billy becomes Michael Jackson's co-manager. And then for that year, this was during the bad tour. And that year, Billy toured with him. And he was behind the scenes. He, he spoke with Michael on a number of occasions, um, went to Neverland and stayed there, um, got to know him really, really well. Um, and it's, it's a great thing. It really is. And it, it's all in the book. Um, so that, that's a, that whole thing. I mean, that really was a, you know, kind of a testament to just how influential and powerful Billy was. Yeah, I wonder if he did the moonwalk. Oh no, 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 no! It's a great picture, though. It's a great picture in the book with Billy and Michael um, and Frank DeLeo backstage at one of the concerts. So, but Billy knew a, Billy knew a number of entertainers. He was really good friends with Bob Hope, who had no idea had been connected to the mob. Um, you know, he knew Andy Griffith. He knew um, a whole slew of people. You know, they're in. They're all in the book. He had been called in. You know, the one thing I did learn about. In doing this story, you know, I've been a reporter for many years, and I, you know, the world, everyone thinks of the world as being black and white with some gray. After doing this book, you realize it's not just some gray, it is a lot of gray. And it's populated by guys like people like Billy DeLeo. And, you know, we're talking not, a, not just for organized crime, we're talking about, you know, entertainment, sports, business, you know, there are times, and, you know, you, it's reflected in the book where they turn to people like Billy to settle issues, you know, settle scores, settle contract issues. Um, you know, and Billy ends up spending a lot of time, particularly out in California, uh, in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills. And he's, you know, he's doing deals, um, settling issues involving a number of different entertainers. So, you know, it's a really, you know, it was a really, real, for me, it was a really good inside view on, you know, what goes on within the underbelly. Um, of American business and entertainment. Well, I'm wondering too, you know, how this all happened for Billy since, you know, being Irish, he usually couldn't be a made man. How, how did this happen and so that he could become um, the head of the family? Russell Buffalino said it. So, you know, there's a scene in the book where um, Russell says to Billy, you know, they're driving back from New York and he says to him just out of the blue, this is they're together maybe about four or five years now and their families are very close and they're very close. And he says to him, are you going to be with me? And, and Billy goes, you know, uh, yeah, of course I'm going to be with you. He's not really sure what he means, you know, because of course I am. And then, you know, that's it. And a few days later, um, Buffalino takes Billy to a local hotel that he owns, and there are like 40 of the most influential and powerful gangsters from around the country. And Billy's half Italian and half Irish. So traditionally, you'd think he could not be made. But... Russell just within a matter of 10 seconds says, you know, Billy, you know, he's my son. And now you know that he's one of us. And that was it. And there was no, as Billy says, there were no saints. There was no fire burning. There was none of that stuff. Russell said it and it was done. 
and Billy DeLay was the last made member of the Buffalino crime family. Well, they should have made me. I don't know why they... <laughs> What's going on? How does it feel? Like, how does this whole process? How did it change you? This is a kind of a different process than when you're when you're doing the uh, true crime sense of you know finding someone like you were doing the couple of books before this. Um, how how has this process changed you? Uh, it hasn't necessarily changed me, but it was a completely different process in that when I did, let's say, for instance, like all of my other books whether it's Deconstructing Sammy or my Durst book or, you know, the last two, uh, Beautiful Child and Finding Sharon, which became a Netflix film, um, I'm dealing with so many different people. You know, I'm interviewing so many principals. I'm inter interviewing family members. I'm interviewing law enforcement, FBI guys, uh, U.S. attorneys. In this case, it's just one person. I'm sitting with Billy and I'm listening to his story. And, you know, it's one interview after another. And we did each and every interview in Russell Buffalino's old home in Kingston, Pennsylvania. The house was left behind uh, to Billy's son, who happens to be named Russell, um, after Russell's wife died in 2006. So we, and it's like a museum in there. It's remarkable. It's like it hadn't been changed since 1970. And uh, we did all the interviews there. And so it was, you know, for me, it was really, A, about getting, even though he reached out to me and he did want to talk, Billy had never spoken before, whether it was law enforcement or much less to a member of the, you know, a journalist or writer. And so it was difficult for him to start opening up. He didn't, I don't think he realized how difficult it would be. When we talked about Russell, he talked about Russell all day long, how much he loved him, how great he was, how smart he was, what a great father figure, this, this, and that, all these great anecdotes. And then we start getting to the really, you know, the meaty stuff, you know, whether it be um, Hoffa, for instance, or, you know, the Kennedys or, um, you know, even the, the Trump stuff and a million other things that we talked about. That's when it got harder for him. And, you know, his answers would be short early on. And then maybe after about three or four months, he got down to really him trusting me and, you know, and about me, <laughs> about me feeling comfortable. I will admit that, you know, I was still so blown away by the fact that they reached out to me. My first couple of times that I went there to go meet with them, I thought maybe they would tick off over something I had written before, about them, either <laughs> as a newspaper reporter or in the quiet time. They kept looking behind me. Because the way we saw yeah. off, we're in the kitchen doing interviews, and behind me are the stairs that go downstairs into Russell's old den, where he held all his meetings and got his bar, and he did these great pictures with these old Godfather actors. And I remember I kept looking, turning around, because it was dark, too. And I kept turning around and looking, um, you know, I even told my wife, I remember I told her the first couple of times I went there, I, you know, oh, actually, you know, when I got there, I said, well, I'm here just to let you know I got here. Um, and then when I'd leave, I say, yeah, I'm out. So that was the first couple of times because I really wasn't sure. Um, but after a while, it was great. And, you know, Billy, you know, we got, we got comfortable with each other. And yeah, he had, and he had, you know, you're trying to ask a guy to relive 50, you know, 50, 60 years of history. He's 76 now, 76, 77. Yeah. And you're trying to pry this out of his mind. And, you know, we'd be done with an interview. We would have, we, we'd have spoken maybe for an hour and a half, two interviews and I'm getting ready to wrap up. And he would just start talking about something. I go, I go, what? You know, and it'd be something <laughs> like really great. I'm like, where'd that come from? And we'd be there for another 45 minutes talking about that. So it was, um, you know, it was a long project to go from idea to actual book in like almost three years now. Um, but like I said, judging by the response, you know, I just um, got an email from the publisher today, William Morrow, that they just went into a second printing, which is after just two days. And it's on several bestseller lists. So I know he's happy. Um, and of course I am. So, you know, obviously readers are responding to it. So how do you decide what you're going to put in? Like, was there certain stories that you just kept out because uh, for whatever reason? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. So I, I will tell you probably I used maybe 10, 15% of what he told me. Um, I took the real media, obviously had to use the really big stuff. Um, you know, the Hoffa stuff, mm -hmm. some of the Kennedy stuff, um, Cuba. Um, of obviously the Trump stuff. I mean, it's like four or five. Yeah. <laughs> it's like four or five Trump scenes in here. I mean, he's meeting with Trump when he's actually the head of the Buffalino family 
and they can't come to a deal. They're, they're talking about a couple of deals in the 1990s, and they can't come to agreement because Trump's just too greedy. Um, and it's this infamous story about the coin toss where Trump owed these two developers some money and you know, like $7 million, and he didn't want to pay it. He wanted to pay him six. And so they end up flipping a coin for it, and, of course, Trump wins. So he takes the million dollars off of it. Um, but, you know, I think I used maybe 85%. No, I, I didn't use. I used 15% of what he told me because, again, I'm telling a story here. You know, this is, you know, think of it as a two-hour movie. I'm telling a story, and it has to be cohesive. It has to be interesting. It has to remain complex. And I don't want to repeat anything. It's like there was so many examples of Billy, let's say, later in his career being the mob negotiator and intervening in one thing after another. And it's like, these are all great stories, but I don't think people are going to want to read about him in 10 different situations. So I picked out some really good ones. And, you know, you see Billy in action. Um, and, you know, and you'll recognize, most people will recognize some of the names that he dealt with. You know, some of them are really big names. And um, so I did that, you know, and then you had to keep, you also had to keep the story on pace. Um, so you have to pick and choose, you know, um, you know, where you're going to start, where you're going to end each chapter, or basically for the book, how you're going to begin it, what's the middle and what's the end. And, you know, in this case, yeah. to show why he became so close to Russell, you know, there's an example, you know, very, very early on in the book about a very tragic event that occurred uh, with a pet that Billy had, um, which appears to be, you know, a scene that many re readers are reacting to. Um, so, you know, so that's it. I mean, I think you know the drill, too. I mean, you basically yeah. think about it in your head, how you're going to tell this story. And, you know, the chore for me was to go through these, you know, thousands of pages of interviews and then just, you know, pick and choose the best the best anecdotes and, you know, try to turn it into something very readable. How has your opinion changed of him after doing this and spending all this time with him for what it was at the beginning or even before you had actually met him to now, um, now you know him quite a bit better and spent so much time? It, it, I guess that's personal, but has your opinion changed drastically? Yeah, because, you know, when you cover him, I didn't know the man. And listen, you know, Billy didn't hide hide to hide from the fact that he was a criminal, that he was he's a convicted felon, that he was a not just a member of organized crime, but a very, very high ranking member of organized crime. He headed a fran he headed a crime family. You know, when he was arrested in two thousand six, you know, his house was raided and I think he had every law enforcement agency in the nation there in front of his house. They even had a Chinook helicopter flying above. Um, so we did not, I mean, so we did not try to pay the, paint a pretty picture about that. I mean, Billy is who he is, right. you know, he's a member of organized crime. He had been a member of organized crime for many, many, many years. And he didn't shy away from any of that. You know, he, he took ownership for his life and what he did, um, and the life that he led and, you know, brought a lot of pain to his family, especially to his wife, who's in the book, um, who's a remarkable woman. You know, I mean, Billy's got three kids and they're all very successful in terms of one's in a lawyer, one's an attorney, one is uh, in the school system up in the, up there. And another one's a business executive for a major healthcare company. So, you know, um, but that said, you know, even though I went into this not knowing him and, you know, there was also very little written about Billy. I mean, what was the Buffalino family? It's, you know, aside from my book. You go online, you know, whatever, Wikipedia or anything else like that, there's not a lot on Billy, which is, to me, remarkable. Um, but, of course, when you spend three years with someone and you're talking like that and, you know, you get to like somebody and, you know, and you understand their motivations and why they got involved in something. And, you know, um, the one thing we did not discuss a lot is, was violence. Um, I don't think... Billy was necessarily what you'd call a heavy guy, you know, like a leg break or anything like that. He was more, he, he was more like Russell. He was more like the negotiator, the fixer. Um, but there are scenes in the book where, you know, you see where if you go against him in any way or you cross him, you know, you're going to have to deal with some things. So, um, we do, we, we still talk. I mean, we talk and we're going to continue to talk. You know, I just spoke to him again this morning. So, um, 
you know, he lives a quiet life now um, with his wife. He's got grandkids. And, uh, you know, I don't think he expected his book project to be what it's become in the fact that he actually opened up and told this remarkable story. Um, but now that it's actually happened, you know, we went through our process together and now that the book is out, it's actually happened and it's getting the kind of reaction that it's gotten so far. You know, I think he's enjoying it. Well, that's good. I mean, it's, uh, sounds like it turned out good. Um, some of the people I'm surprised about, like the, um, Marlon Brando, um, and his, his connection with Marlon Brando and Suge Knight was another one. I, I had no idea there was any sort of connection there. So Billy, well, let me start with Brando in that, um, Russell, Russell Buffalino had a huge hand in the making of The Godfather and there had been rumors to that and there had been, you know, some articles in the past with, with a mention of that. But Billy was there. He had been with Russell for like five years now, five, six years. And they were in Pennsylvania at one of Russell's dress factories. And, a, and there was a call that came in and Billy picked it up. And the person on the other end said, it's Marlon Brando calling for Russell Buffalino. And Billy didn't believe it. And he turns to Russ and he goes, hey, there's some guy on the phone. He says he's Marlon Brando. And Russell goes, give me that phone. And it was Marlon Brando. What happened was Brando was looking for inspiration to play Don Corleone. And he was looking for a so-called mob boss to talk to. And everyone involved in the production pointed him to Russell. And Russell agreed to meet with him. And they met a number of times. And, you know, the take in The Godfather is pretty much a take on Russell. The way, you know... His quiet demeanor, just about everything without him. And then, you know, I mean, the scenes are great. And again, they're all firsthand. Um, you know, there's this big, there's this big time, uh, mob guy, Michael Francesi, who's got this YouTube channel with like a fat, a million, like a million subscribers. And he was even talking about this the other day on his channel about how he was down there, but he didn't even realize some of the stuff that Billy was saying. So it's all new. It's all first, you know, it's the first time anyone's talked about it. And it was really interesting in terms of, Russell's hold over the Godfather and what it meant for that yeah. production. And then later on, many, many years later in the nineties, you know, Billy's, who, Billy's not ahead of the, of the family and they have their eyes on this rapper who wants to get away from Suge Knight and they say fine. And Billy says, you're with me now. And he calls Suge Knight and he's, and Suge knows who Billy is. And Billy goes to him, Hey, you guys with me now. And Suge Knight goes, okay. And that's that. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and Suge Knight was a, he was a pretty, he's in jail now, but he was a pretty tough guy. So, um, you know, for him to basically back off like he did and so quickly, um, is a testament to, you know, just how powerful Billy was at the time. Yeah. Pretty, he was a notorious figure. Imagine, I couldn't imagine the being, um, in a film like Marlon Brando and I'm, and calling up Buffalino for advice on playing. I, I would feel very intimidated. I mean, <laughs> as it turns out, Russell did not like Marlon Brando. Um, he thought, <laughs> even worse. <laughs> he thought that Brando, you know, um, Russell liked to be respected and he thought that Brando did not pay him the due respect or something to that effect. But Brando knew exactly who he was and what he was doing because, you know, there's a scene in the movie where during the, um, or in the book where during the filming of the wedding scene, um, you know, Brando was drinking all day, and towards the end, he actually turned around and mooned the entire audience, but it was filled with Buffalino people. Many of the extras were with the Buffalino family, and when he realized what he had done, he put word out to the right people to tell Russell that he meant no offense. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, did did Billy talk about um, what they got right and wrong, uh, you know, with the Godfather movie and making it? Uh, it was a pretty accurate. Billy, you know, it's funny because it wasn't so much about being accurate. I mean, they had guys in the movie, so they had real life. You know, the guy who played Luca Brasi was with the Colombo family, but he was sta he was hanging with the Buffalinos. And in fact, there's a scene in the book where Russell chastises him for stealing some equipment there, some very expensive equipment, before he actually got the role. Um, the one movie where Billy said was very accurate was Goodfellas. He said the, the one that really portrayed his world the most accurately was Goodfellas. Um, you know, but keep in mind Goodfellas, which was a great film, 
uh, just like The Sopranos was a great series, they were basically focused on family members in a very particular locale in the country. You know, whether it was in Goodfellas, it was New York, or if it was The Sopranos, it was New Jersey and New York. You know, where the Buffalinos, even though they were based in Pennsylvania as well as New York City, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Russell was nationwide. He was coast to coast. You know, he was everywhere. Right. And so that was the, that's the difference between, you know, the power of the Buffalino family as compared to the power of those other families, one fictional and the other one in Goodfellas, which was real. But, you know, Billy knew many of these people. Um, you know, he knew guys like John Gotti. He did business with John Gotti. He did business with other members, other crime members in New York. You know, it's in the book. Um, Billy spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, which was just insane the way Billy describes it. Um, you know, and how actually, you know, uh, one of the Philadelphia guys there tried to put a hit on Billy and it was the FBI that told Billy this and Billy took care of that situation. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, he did tell me though that Russell, despite everything he had done at first to prevent the Godfather from being made and then from giving it its full blessing, he did say that Russell never saw the movie and never wanted to see it. Even when they offered him, uh, the producer Al Ruddy offered Russell his own premiere. Russell never wanted to see it. You know, it's, did he ever, did he give any opinion or did he ever talk about anything that the way the U.S. and the world is now as compared to what it was when in the crime families had so much power? Uh, it's just that it's, it's obviously completely different. You know, law enforcement really took a sledgehammer to organize crime starting in the 1980s. You know, when they could use, uh, the RICO Act to start prosecuting people. And, you know, one, one, one head of one, you know, a head of a family would go to jail. Another head would go to jail. Other members would go to jail. Um, so, you know, the question today is, does, you know, the Italian mafia even still exist? And it does not to the degree even close to what it was, you know, before the 1980s into the 1990s. Um, but it's still there. There's always going to be a need. Um, or they'll always find a way to make, to, you know, to create a need to have them. Um, uh, but there's other crime families now. You know, you got the Russian mob, particularly in New York and Brooklyn. Um, you know, you got Asian mobs now. So it's just not, they just don't carry the kind of power, you know, that they used to, you know, where they controlled unions and, you know, huge union, national unions and pension funds and things like that. So it is, it is a different world. Yeah. Did he give an opinion about Trump being president or any of that stuff? Being <laughs> that he had a history? <laughs> he, just, he doesn't, he doesn't like Trump. He just said he was, he said he was arrogant then and he's arrogant today. You know, I just found the stories about Trump. Um, and I'm not taking a political position here. He, no, I don't, no, get, but, yeah. I don't want to get involved. In this is coming just from a from a journalist and you know interviewing someone who knew him. Um, I just found it to be really interesting and even perhaps reckless on Trump's part to do these deals himself. Um, you know, typically, you know, if you want to do business with the mob, particularly with the head of a crime family, you're going to have some flunky go meet with them, so you can have complete deniability. And, yeah. you know, Trump and Billy are talking about, you know, doing deals, you know, they used to have these phone cards, um, that they used to sell, you know, before cell phones were, you know, 10, 10, 20, $30 worth of time. You can go call overseas and you put a pretty picture on it. And he was going to put a picture of the Taj Mahal. Only he wanted a lot of money, uh, upfront cash and he wanted it handed directly to him in his office. And Billy said, no, it's too much money. And then there was another deal where they were going to do timeshares together. And, um, you know, people would come visit Atlantic City. They get, you know, a two, three day stay. Only you had to go to a, you know, a two hour timeshare presentation. And at these presentations, you get gifts. And one of the gifts Trump wanted to give was a copy of his book, The Art of the Deal. And only <laughs> Trump, uh, I'm sorry, Billy had to buy the books. He would have had to buy five to 10,000 copies, which would have cost him six figures. And Billy said, no, I'm not fronting that kind of money. But Billy also realized that had he bought those books, this is how Trump operated. Trump's book would rise. It used to go up and down the bestseller list. Now you know why. He would have people yeah. buy, you know, large numbers of the book. So Billy realized what the purpose of it was. It was for Trump to get his, you know, keep his book at the top of the uh, 
that's serverless. So he said, no, we're not going to put that kind of money out. But I just thought it was just, it, you know, sharing that story, those stories about Trump and the coin flip and all of that, um, you know, it kind of gets, gives some insight into him um, in terms of, you know, his, um, I'll call it reckless. I don't know if anyone else would, you know, recklessness in terms of who he's actually meeting with, given who he is. You know, and you could see that when he was even president, you know, when he woke up one day and said, I'm going to go meet with the head of North Korea. And everyone's going, what? Well, you know, I think you could put the two together in that, you know, he just shoots from the hip. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that's really, really interesting. Well, let's 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 give out your contact information, social media, website. Where do people find you? So websites, uh, Um Instagram is matt.berkbeck.author. Um, and if you want to email me, it's berkbeck.matt at gmail.com. Yeah. Any other gangsters or anybody out there that <laughs> <laughs> wants to get a hold of you? There you go. Well, we'll have all that up on the website, of course, and stuff like that. So people can find it easily. And, uh, how was it? You must have been interviewing over the COVID somewhat. How was that? It was, um, it, we were fine. I mean, we started, you know, COVID hit in March of 2020. I actually met him in a restaurant a couple of weeks after I got that email. So it would be in September of 2020. And we started doing interviews maybe a month later, October or so. Uh, we were fine. You know, there was no concerns. If any of us felt anything, you know, it was me and Bill. And there were two others that were involved, his son and an associate of Bill's. It was just the four of us. The associate was the guy that actually reached out to me. He was a friend. And we kept this project quiet, you know, for two, at least two years, you know. Um, and that was intentional. We didn't want anyone knowing that Billy had been talking and was working on something. So it really didn't come out. The news of Billy or you know, this book really didn't come out until earlier this year. Um, and it was fine. We didn't have any issues. Um, as it, what's actually funny, that's not funny, but interesting is that, you know, a couple of us, not me, but we did, did come down with COVID, but it was long after we finished all the interviews. So that's how it goes. First time back in Seattle, I got COVID. So yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, again, the book, The Life We Choose, and our um, guest is the author, Matt Burtbeck. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.